It's time for Where Are They Now again on the program. And as a young man, uh, went along with uh, with my cousins to the 1995 first semi final. And the goal by this man that put Richmond in front in the third quarter remains the loudest roar I've ever heard at a live game of football. I speak of Chris Nash, who kicked, I think it was a sixth consecutive goal for Richmond in that match to give them the lead against the Bombers. They would go on and win. But, Chris, thanks for joining us. Yeah, no worries, Darren. Great to uh, have a chat. Might start there, I guess. Uh, obviously, your recollections would have been the enormity of the contest and what it was doing for the uh, for the Tigers at the time. But yeah, I know I was only young at the time, but I can't get over the roar of the crowd when you uh, when you put that one through. Yeah, it was it was enormous uh, that day. Uh, I mean, I mean, the second half. Uh, I guess we had the lift. We had a pretty uh, pretty ordinary first half, and Ethan were well and truly on top of us at half time, but. The way the boys rallied in the second half, and uh, look, look, even going into the final series, we, we would, uh, given Richmond's lack of success over a long period of time, you know, we generally had about five or six or seven thousand people watching us train. So, so that was a huge buzz for all of us young blokes playing, and to hear that noise in the second half when we we just got ahead, um, I guess it kept us uh, striving to, to uh, play even better and finish uh, Essendon off that game. And that you would do, uh, obviously. Touching on where are they now? Obviously, post your, your retirement or at the end of your, your time with Port Adelaide, at the conclusion of 1999, you've had a fair bit to do with uh, with old Scotch. I guess can you tell us your involvement there and and obviously you're helping out a little bit with uh, with Ivanhoe Grammar as well. Yeah, well, I guess um, <clears throat> I was fortunate to get an opportunity to work with uh, Scotch College just on a part time basis. Terry Wheeler, who uh, had been at uh, Scotch, uh, invited me down. Uh, uh, Terry lectured me at uni and uh, got me down, and I, and I haven't left since. Fifteen years on, and uh, have enjoyed uh, seeing some young and developed some young players coming through the ranks, which has been terrific. And my my boys are going to Ivanhoe Grammar at the moment, so I'm just um, helping out the coaches down at uh, Old Ivanhoe at the moment in, in B grade, which is. Uh, been a good experience as well. And um, I think you post your footy career, you did a little bit of work with um, with the NBL, didn't you? Oh, look, I guess that's where you, we lead into uh, where I currently work yeah. and have done for 15 years at AFL Sports Ready. I, um, myself, I did a traineeship in 1995 when the program was initially uh, ran and it was a Kevin Cheedy uh, concept mm-hmm. uh, with Bill Kelty and... Uh, Ian Collins at the time, Simon Crean, uh, backed it from a federal government perspective and um, yeah, I did a, a traineeship and, and worked for the Women's National Basketball League which was um, was pretty good fun for a single young uh, footballer uh, being a midget and uh, working alongside young women who were 6 foot 5, 6 foot 6. So it was, it was a good fun experience but that's how I um, got involved in the traineeship program myself and um, I guess after uh, my experience at Port Powell, I was fortunate enough to get an opportunity to work uh, w- with AFL Sport Treaty and um, have been there since in 15 years and, and uh, had a few various roles uh, over that period of time. Obviously, it's an AFL-sponsored organisation which helps young adults find their way into training and employment. Uh, I guess in your words, can you sort of describe it better than that, what, what you guys are striving to do? Oh, look, yeah, well, look, we... Um, we support young people with, with, with a career option uh, in, in the employment area, and that could be uh, in the sport and recreation industry, in the corporate sector, in the business sector. Um, uh, we, we have around about 700 young people uh, nationally that, that we find uh, opportunities, and I guess it, it's an opportunity for those uh, young people who, who may have gone into a, a university, want to defer for a year, uh, didn't quite get the score that they were after to get into university, uh, we help them, and then they apply as mature age after they do their their twelve months work placement with with various organisations, uh, obviously around Melbourne and, and regional parts of uh, Victoria, and also around the country as well. Um, I, get, I guess the other component of that we're our own RTO, so we deliver all the training from uh, certificate two to diploma level in uh, sport and recreation, sports development, business, uh, fitness as well. So. And, and that scope is, is, is growing and developing. I guess the other component we, we, we do is we um, provide about, oh, there's about 195 AFL players who are doing a certificate uh, three to diploma level qualification with us. Uh, and we, we, we assist uh, young footballers as well transitioning out of the game uh, with some work placement opportunities. Uh, uh, well, gee, from, from banking to to zookeeping, to, to all sorts of fields. So I guess that sort of sums up, uh, in, in a nutshell, uh, 
how we help young people, uh, not just footballers, but also, as I said, there's 700 uh, non-footballers out there and 60% of those are females that we help transition in, into work. And for information on that, the website uh, www.aflsportsready or lowercase.com.au for a range of information and if you wanted to get in contact with uh, the lads about some various options available for you. And it is a, obviously a really important pathway and even one within the footballing realms that we've seen the game get better at where often players obviously put heart and soul into a career and then they might be on the scrap heap for one of a better in- expression by 23, 24 years of age and uh, important that they have something to fall back on because they might not have even thought about that at, at any stage of their career previously? Uh, absolutely. It's, it's an important component and I guess it's um, it's growing with, with the game now. I mean, there's what's the average lifespan? Just a bit over four years, 4.4, 4.5 years now. So it's not a long period of time that footballers are involved in the game and I guess uh, in our attempt with our partnership with the Players Association, we, we attempt to um, give players an opportunity to experience different uh, areas that they've got passion and interest in and um, if they can transition and, and find an employer uh, through some qualifications that we provide as well, I guess that's one of our main aims that we try to achieve with the programs that we support with, with the Players Association. Chris Nash is with us, former uh, Tiger and Port Adelaide player, 161 games across the career for 228 goals as well. Uh, obviously arriving at the Tigers from Wangaratta, which is now a nice little Tigers uh, stronghold, obviously playing a pre-season game there uh, every year, but understanding your junior All-Australian selection alongside Wayne Campbell, Robert Harvey, Jose Romero, so a handy bunch of players coming through, but I guess can you arrive uh, describe your arrival at uh, at Tigerlands? Uh, yeah, look, it's a lot different to... Uh, I was drafted uh, number five in 1988, and I think I got a phone call. Um, my mum <coughs> rang the principal of the school, and, and I think a little post-it note was handed to me um, that <laughs> you're drafted to Richmond. Um, <laughs> it's certainly not how the top five and the top ten... Um, get introduced to uh, the media these days, which is fine. The game has certainly grown, but uh, certainly different times. But that was, um, I guess, my findings that, I, that I'd be going to Richmond, which, uh, which I was wrapped about. Um, I, I didn't come down to Melbourne in 1989. I played about 12 reserves games. I wanted to finish my year 12 um, with my family back, back in the country. So I did the pre-season. I was down here for a couple of months living with my uh, sister at the time. Uh, went back, completed my qualifications at, at home and uh, managed about 12 reserves games that year and then moved at the end, end of 89. So, um, look, I think my very first practice match I played at the Junction Oval and that centre-half back was Jim Jeff. At full forward was Michael Roach and Mark Lee had just come back from an injury and he was in the ruck. So um, there were certain, certainly some Tiger greats that I was introduced to and um, that, for me that was just a great experience to rub shoulders with some of those guys and... Um, yeah, it was a great day. So I remember a couple of pre-season training, tra- training camps that we had uh, down at Rawson at Mully and mm. Evan Bartlett was a coach and uh, I can remember Paul Callery as the fitness advisor at the time and I mean, you, you certainly in those days you, you learn a fair bit about yourself because you, <laughs> you were thrown into the, the deep end straight away but um, look, the programs that are set up for young players developing now are, are, are a lot different than and how I experienced uh, VFL, AFL footy, and uh, I guess probably to the, to the better and, and to make sure that the players are, are developed in, a, in an elite pathway program, which was terrific. Were you a Tiger supporter growing up? No, I was a Magpie right. supporter. My, I uh, obviously played for the Wangaratta Magpies, and uh, as you said, I uh, was fortunate enough to get an opportunity to play Field Cup with Wayne, Wayne Carey. And, uh, I think being a little bloke, we played in Canberra, and I've still got some, some visual of uh, the ground being underwater at Monica Oval. So um, for a little bloke uh, living under Wayne Carey and the likes, um, I, I, had a, I had a pretty good series uh, given the conditions. So I guess that didn't, didn't hurt my chances of being uh, drafted that year. Chris Nash is with us. Uh, you played the first three games of 1990 before eventually winning the reserves best and fairest uh, that year. Uh, you come back and, and play in a victory, your first victory in the closing game of that season. So obviously uh, a nice start once you had the studies behind you, I guess, that you were 100% focused on footy, won that best and fairest in the twos and got your uh, got your first look at it at AFL level. Yeah, I probably played around about with 89 and, and uh, 1990. I probably played about 25 to 30 reserves game, which was a good grounding for me as well, and just the doses that I had of senior experience 
um, I had a, had a good year in '91, but because I think it was uh, from the two years of just uh, getting uh, conditioned to the pace of AFL football and the requirements needed, your, your diet, your fitness, uh, your endurance, your speed, all those areas, and in the weight room as well. So all those areas of your game, we had to really to work on, which I did, and, and obviously went out and, and did okay in '91. But um, thing about that that last game is, you know, I was running alongside Michael Mitchell when he, I think he had six or seven bounces, and I uh, don't know why he didn't handball it to me, but uh, <laughs> of course he won goal of the year when he ran down the wing there at Sydney Cricket Ground, which um, probably that was one of the highlights of my career, being so young in my fourth game, um, yelling out for Mitch, but after about the fourth bounce, I said, just go for it, mate, but he wasn't listening anyway. <laughs> well, he uh, the in mind. It's one of those ones where, yeah, if, uh, if it doesn't work, you probably get a bit of a spray, but you end up kicking goal of the year if it does. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you're Michael Mitchell back then, yeah. and you're as quick as he was, he uh, had a full license. To do that, so. <laughs> so we had a good year in in '91. Obviously, the Tigers I think they lost a 50-50 game with the Saints early in the season. It was sort of seesawing for a while, and ended up being uh, a little bit of a battle. But yeah, you, you still kicked four in each of the first two games at a bag of six, a bag of five, 38 goals in all, and uh, played uh, all bar one game. So really starting to, to find your feet. Did the same thing in '92, playing all bar one game as well, with a, with a few bags there as well. And mm. could you? see at that stage, uh, I guess, the, the wheel turning at all for the Tigers, or was it tough times? We know 93, 94 started to show signs of what you do in 95. Mm. Oh, look, a lot of uh, Richmond fans obviously stopped me and said you had a great year in 95, the, the team did, and um, I guess it was a mini success. Everyone talks, and, and then rightly so, Richmond hadn't had a lot of success, but I guess, I guess uh, when I first joined Richmond, I deemed 93, 94 and 95 obviously playing in the prelim final, but just the build-up. When I first joined the Tigers, we, we were, I was obviously involved in the Saga Skins campaign, so I can remember training at um, 5 o'clock in the afternoon and finishing at 7 and going down to Swan Street and Bridge Road, um, rattling tins pretty much just to get some, some coins into the club to try and save it. So it was pretty de- desperate times. and I, I guess that hardened a few of us young blokes up. Um, it was, it was a was a rude awakening to an AFL BFL club mm. having to do that, but that's just where Richmond were at at the time. And um, to, to actually uh, build together as a young group, and then the complement of uh, you know Michael Gale and Greg Deer, uh, Paul Broderick, uh, Matthew Dundas, Jamie Elliott, which which were all trading deals done, you know, at the end of '92, heading into '93, and then the addition of Jamie Tape and Matthew Rogers for '94. Um, and then Paul Bullis uh, come over from South Australia. So, so we built a really uh, strong core group of young people wanting to, to really achieve something. And you know, the club, we had the club steered steered into a pretty strong direction. So, um, th- for me, that was a really uh, healthy experience to know that um, when the club was surviving and, and it was heading into a strong direction, and, and I was I was a very small part of that. Uh, it would have been obviously very satisfying. I guess your thoughts on the, you know, the well-documented KB departure. John Northy would arrive, and there'd be a, a fair upside for those. Obviously, in between that was Alan Jeans, of course, in, in 1992. Yeah. But uh, I guess your thoughts on on that sort of trifecta of years, where you went from KB to a legend in Alan Jeans to a man that would help resurrect you in, in John Northy. Yeah, look, I I really enjoyed um, Kevin Bartlett. I, I thought he was very astute. Um, person of the game and obviously uh, that, that goes without saying given his, his knowledge of the game but um, I, I guess um, we we as, as a club at the time we just didn't have, have the players to really perform and, and compete against the very good teams um, you know the, the players I mentioned earlier were, were at the end of their career and they played in the 80 premiership and, and the club really had to, to grow again and, and regenerate, regenerate with some youth and and that's what I guess it started to do. And unfortunately for Kevin, they didn't. Um, the club didn't choose him to, to to go on and nurture those young people. So I guess with Alan coming in, um, uh, so I really enjoyed Kevin. Uh, I thought he was a great coach. But I guess with with Alan, uh, there was a different element. I think for people like Wayne Campbell and myself and, and Matthew Knights, um, these type of players, we we learnt so much under Alan Jeans. It was just unfortunate that. Um, you know, he didn't. Get, he couldn't go on for health reasons and coaches. But what what a great uh, experience it was for someone like myself uh, and and those guys I mentioned to to get that dose of of Alan Jeans. I think it really helped us um, for the for the next few years. In fact, uh, and then 
with, with John Northey coming in. I, I guess John really had that element of, of bonding together and team, and, and we did everything together. And uh, I guess and building soldiers together and getting them to run through brick walls from a motivational level. That, that's what John Northey could do. And I guess he was moulding us young group to really perform that way. And and I guess uh, we, we we commenced to do that. Uh, you know, heading into 1995. Uh, 1993, I mean, we, we are speaking to Chris Nash, former Tiger and, and Port Adelaide player. Uh, 74,000 at a pre-season grand final between Richmond and Essendon, which these days seems unheard of, but was seen as a bit of a launching pad for the club. But head to 94, where you would win six games in a row between round 12 and, and 17 of that year and, and launch towards the finals. And I think uh, Tony Free getting injured and a couple of other things that happened. Uh, he got uh, his jaw broken late in that yeah. season and, and a couple of other little things. Saw so you just miss out, getting beaten by Carlton and Geelong. But... I'm sure the enthusiasm post-94 heading into 95 would have been pretty high. You then won your first seven in, in 95 before losing Matthew Richardson. So, again, a, a couple of little injuries. But that, that feeling throughout the early stages of, of 1995, not just for sort of someone like yourself, but I'm sure for supporters, given you'd done the, the Save Our Skins campaign only a few years earlier, to be a powerhouse of the competition again must have been an enormous feeling. Yeah, well, we had momentum, I guess. And, and what the young group started to believe, or I certainly did, that we started to believe in each other, you know. Uh, there was a series of a number of players who now had played 80 to 90 to 100 games. Uh, they'd been at the club for four or five years. And I guess the timing was really, you know, was really right for us to, to perform together. And um, winning seven in a row, we'd done a brilliant pre-season. Uh, 94 pre-season was great. I think we went to the Gold Coast for, for eight eight. Um, Eight days and then 95 pre-season was excellent under John. And, um, yeah, winning those first seven gave us a lot of belief. Uh, I guess the only problem we had that year, we ran into Geelong in the pre- prelim final. And uh, over the journey during the 90s, I think Gary Ablett averaged about 11 goals against real, 11 or 12 goals. And was certainly our nemesis. So we just couldn't get past Geelong um, in that in that 95 prelim final. But... Uh, yeah, certainly the belief that we'd grown together as a group over, over a few years uh, started to pay dividends at the end of 95. Unfortunately, we, we couldn't get over Geelong in the prelim final. Was there any mental aspect in, in that? Obviously, Geelong would smash Richmond in that prelim. I think there was 89 points, but the, the group would have been riding high off the Essendon win, but was there any belief thinking, oh, geez, we've got the Cats, or was uh, it sort of on reflection, not really? Not really. It was just a matter of, uh, I think they had more mature bodies than we did in the midfield. Yeah. We had Gary Hocking... Um, Mark Bairstow, Paul Couch, uh, of course you had Gary Ablett and say Bill Brown. They had a really solid um, back line, um, Barry Stoneham and the like. So really, you know, we were all, well, at the time we were probably, as I said, 22, 23, and we were really starting to hit our peak. Those guys were 26, 27, 28, and really mature bodies. And I, during my time... Our bodies just couldn't compete with, with the Geelong bodies at the time. We just weren't big enough. And I guess I could say the same for West Coast bodies against our uh, immature bodies in, in 92 and 93, 94. Uh, we couldn't really get near West Coast as well because they just had much much bigger in size, albeit we beat them at up to Sobel in 94. But generally, they, they, their bodies were much bit more mature than what we were. Speaking with Chris Nash, uh, the, the departure of John Northey with Robert Walls coming in in 96, I think shocked a lot of people with the manner with which that happened, the, the, the basic coach swap. Uh, your reflections on that? Yeah, well, I think at the time it was a bit of a shock to all of us. Uh, John had us, uh, and had us and had the, the club heading in very much the right direction. There was a strong belief under John. Um, uh, you know, going into the 96 season that... Um, Given another hard pre-season, we'd like to go one step further. That was the aim that we discussed after we'd lost against Geelong as a group of boys. We we got together on the the next the Sunday and the Monday, and that was certainly our aim. And I think on the Monday afternoon or even Tuesday morning, there was a big press uh, release, or John had come out and said he's quitting the club. And uh, I think that's when it to say the chemistry were, was was right there with John or the with the group he had. Um, Wolsey come in. Um, was a good coach uh, in his own right, had his different theories, had his different philosophies. And I guess we'd learn our craft for three years under John and we're all, yeah. we're all pretty determined to keep going that, on that path. And I, you know, it must have been hard for, for, for Wolsey as well because it took a while for all of us to adapt to his coaching style. And, and of course, uh, if you're 5%, 10% off, which we were, I think, for 
pretty much the first half of 96. Um, we didn't make finals that, that year. So, um, and John, uh, sorry, um, I think Wolsey was, was exited from the club, um, halfway through 97. So, or towards the end of 97. So, I guess it was made hard for him because, um, we, we, we had grown together as a as club and we'd had our fair share of coaches given we'd had, um, Bartlett teams and then normally the chemistry was right there and uh, it just probably just didn't work out for, for Walsy and, and the group that, that we had at the time. No doubt. 11-11 uh, in, in 96 needed to beat, I think, the Kangaroos in the last game to, to make the finals. 97 would be a disappointing year and, and ultimately your last year at the Tigers. Can you yep. sort of talk us through your move to, to Port Adelaide at the end of 97? Yeah, I guess 97 wasn't my... Uh, albeit having a, a great pre-season, I, I wasn't performing um, to the level that... Uh, I and the club would have expected. Um, I probably got starved of opportunities towards the end of the year, and a um, few other players were, get, were getting a game before me. So um, Jeff Geeson was appointed as a coach, I think, uh, just towards the end of the season, and um, probably didn't have uh, many sides. To, there was other players uh, probably in his eyes ahead of me. So um, I guess I had to look at other options and, and poor power. Um, uh, John Cale, I had a chat with John and he offered me a good opportunity to come over to, to the club and help a young uh, list develop given I'd played 140 games or whatever the case was then and, and uh, try and mature the, the young kids in, in Nick Stevens and, and Josh Carr and uh, even Warren Treadray and Chad Collins who were all just 17 year olds at the time so uh, I, I was quite, quite excited by that opportunity to do that, I think I was 26 or 27 at the time so um, hence the reason that uh, I moved to uh, Adelaide with, with my wife and um, uh, we had a good couple of years there. It was a great club and, and they re- received us very well. I just, um, probably from myself, from a, a playing point of view, I st- got the, the dreaded uh, osteitis at the time, mm-hmm. which, which wasn't, uh, they didn't really know how to treat it that well. So um, obviously being a, a little bloke, I only needed to be off the pace for, for 10% and uh, that's what I was, and that, that I really didn't play much after I'd finished uh, at Port Power. Yeah, uh, 18 games across those two seasons. Last game in round nine of, of 1999. And I guess from, from where you sit now, uh, do, do you hold primarily an allegiance with Richmond? Is it Richmond with a soft spot for Port, or do you support both sides? And I guess uh, in summary beyond that, I guess your, your thoughts on where they're at. The Tigers have dropped away after all the promise of, of last year, or is Port Adelaide absolutely flying? Yeah, oh, look, I, I am very appreciative for the opportunity that Port Power gave me, but, but I guess my heart is, is with Richmond. Um, yeah, it's pretty much a club that I grew up with, and, and uh, you know, when you're 17 and, and you start at the club and, and, and you finish the, you know, 10 years down the track, it's, it's a good stint, and um, I'm on the past players committee at the Tigers as well, so I help in a, in a few areas to, uh, to help the club there. So... Um, and um, being a life member of the Tigers as well. So, so yeah, I'm very, very much uh, young and black. There's no doubt about that. Um, and, and I guess um, the, the current situation with the Tigers, um, albeit disappointing, I think um, is probably a, an opportunity now for the club to, to look at uh, uh, some, some younger players coming in and starting to inject some youth and, you know, really start to test out some of the draft picks that they've picked over the last couple of years and, and start to play those kids. Um, it's probably just a, a matter of, of timing, really, with, with a lot of the recycled players they've got. Um, whether they've got too many, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but it probably is, is it's starting. It's not working this, this year. So uh, for me, it, it's, it's given the young kids an opportunity and, and see whether Griffiths can become a very good player and um, and those types of players who've been on the list for a few years now. And it's great to see a day getting a, getting a run now, that day. So... I, I think, um, albeit disappointing uh, for, for the club itself, it's an opportunity now to start to look at some kids and and start to build for the next, you know, three to four to five years. Um, in terms of power, well, what a turnaround in, in a couple of years um, from nearly save our skins rattling the pin. Mm-hmm. And, and I think a lot of praise should go to the, the president who's come in and or the chair who's come in in, in David Kais and how he's managed to to structure the club and, and Keith Thomas, of course, who, who's now proven himself to be uh, a very astute um, CEO. And, and, and I, I just think it's fantastic that someone like Ken Hinckley, who went for um, not just one job interview for, for a coaching role, but, but, but several, and has given the opportunity to the power. And 
and, and, and he's succeeding or, or up to date he is and, he, and you know with a blended mix of some experience there and, and some young uh, young talent that he's brought brought to the club. Um, watching them play now is, is exciting. The way they move the ball, they switch it and take the game on. I, you know, f- full credit to the whole club for how they've turned it around in, in a couple of years. No doubt about that, uh, Chris Nash. We certainly encourage people to get along to aflsportsready.com. Dot au. Good luck with all of the uh, the coaching stuff as well, and, and all the fantastic initiatives uh, with uh, employment opportunities for people as well. We really appreciate you chatting to us about your career. Good on you. Thanks very much.